So as you all know, I'm Dinah Schumacher, one of the second year residents. My interesting case presentation is on vaginal bleeding. So just a few weeks ago, I was actually pulled from another patient's room by one of um, the wide-eyed off-service residents that was rotating in the ED. He tells me I need to come help him see this patient. She's very pregnant and she's lost a lot of blood. So I literally follow a little trail of blood that leads, uh, the nurses are leading me down and now my co-resident is nowhere to be found. So I go ahead and get a little bit more history on my own. She's a 25-year-old female. She's Gravita 1. She's at 30 weeks and five days gestation. She states about 30 minutes ago while lying um, in bed, she felt this big gush of what she estimates as a gallon of bright red blood. She's continuing to leak um, bright red blood. She denies any abdominal pain. She said she's had no recent trauma, injuries, um, denies abuse, and denies recent intercourse. Um, I asked her if she's had any contractions. She's like, I'm not sure what those would feel like, so I'm guessing no. Um, she does say she's had a little bit of low back pain. Her physical exams are uh, significant for a pulse of 122. She's a little anxious. Her abdomen's non-tender. And externally, I see bright red blood without any active oozing. And her sheets are saturated with what appears to me looking like uh, bloody amniotic fluid. So what I'm most concerned about in uh, vaginal bleeding in greater than 20 weeks gestation is placenta placental abruption and placenta previa. Um, and the abruption you'll see on the left is uh, premature separation of the placenta from the uterine lining that leads to painful bleeding. And on the right you'll see uh, the placenta is covering the internal cervical os and that can cause painless vaginal bleeding. Also on my differential is vasa previa. That's when the fetal vessels uh, implant in the lower uterine segment, seen on your left. Also, this could be a laceration of the vagina or cervix, as well as lesions or a bleeding fibroid, like shown um, on that speculum exam. It could also be bloody show, which is um, bloodstained mucus that can happen near the onset of labor. So as an ER physician, uh, next it's stabilization, ABCs. So I have the nurses place two large bore IVs. I also collect blood for um, these labs. I have OB consulted. And then I decide on fluids versus blood transfusion based on her exam and uh, her vitals. I go ahead and grab the ultrasound machine and do a point of care uh, bedside trans abdominal ultrasound. I do see fetal heart tones. I also see baby moving around. As you'll see in the picture, there's very little amniotic fluid, which makes me very concerned about uh, true rupture of membranes. And I see her placenta is low and anterior, but uh, it's very difficult to see if it's covering the Oz uh, by this uh, transabdominal ultrasound. Also, she, uh, the baby is cephalic presentation, which is always a good thing. I go ahead and put, hook the baby up to the baby monitor. I luckily on that bottom um, section, that's the um, maternal, I see no contractions. On the top is the fetal heart tones. Um, there's no bradycardia, there's no tachycardia, it's right there in the middle and there's no fetal decelerations. So I'm not concerned about fetal distress at this point. So there's two ways of confirming rupture of membranes. Um, you can get some of the fluid and look at it under the microscope um, and you'll see the beautiful ferning. You can also use nitrazine paper, that pH paper on the right, that does turn blue with both amniotic fluid and semen. Unfortunately for both of these, blood obscures uh, the details, so you won't see ferning and it can also be turned blue. So not, neither are great options with our patient. So I want to continue to collect information, uh, but I also know instilled in us is third trimester bleeding should not perform a digital uh, exam for concern of causing catastrophic hemorrhage if there's a placenta previa. So I go ahead and call my friendly uh, OB residents and I get the okay because they go ahead and see that she had a recent transvaginal ultrasound that showed no previa. So I continue on uh, with the sterile speculum exam. I luckily see no active bleeding, no lesions, uh, no lacerations. I do see pooling of the amniotic fluid um, without any meconium, so I am again concerned about rupture of membranes. Uh, I do a digital cervical exam. Uh, I feel for dilatation, she's actually two centimeters, and for effacement, she's 50% effaced. So at this point in summary, we have an oliparous female who is hemodynamically stable with painless vaginal bleeding. I did decide on um, IV fluid bolus, and she has pending labs. And she technically has P-PROM. The first P is for preterm, so she is less than 37 weeks. The second P is for premature or pre-labor, which means the rupture of membranes is prior to her onset of contractions. As emergency physicians, we do need to be aware of EMTALA, which stands for um, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. Um, contractions are an emergent medical condition. So in order to think about transferring, you need to take into account both where you would be transferring and the time it would take for transfer. 
and uh, the, where she, the best definitive care would be for both the mom and the baby. Luckily, our patient's not contracting, so um, this does not apply at this time. Um, I go ahead and arrange EMS to take the patient down the street to our OB department, but I continue to work on um, management while she's still in our, my, my care. So I do, do, I do give betamethasone, it's a 12 milligram IM injection, um, that's to enhance fetal lung maturity. Uh, this is given between viability and when the lungs are developed, usually 34 weeks. I also um, have that type and scream that's pending. Um, I'm going to give her Rogam if it comes back that she is Rh negative. Um, we want to do this to prevent any antibody induced hemolysis of future pregnancies for our patients. About 15% of mothers are actually Rh negative and luckily they come in these little vials that are exactly 300 micrograms. Uh, infection can also be both a cause of PPROM as well as um, a secondary consequence of PPROM. So we need to treat for group B strep, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. There's no one perfect way to treat these, uh, but it's usually ampicillin, amoxicillin, and azithromycin. And then we'll kind of move on to tocolytics, which are very controversial. You should discuss um, if you want to give these with whoever's the admitting OB or family medicine physician. Uh, the goal of tocolytics are to delay uh, the delivery of the baby in, in, for enough time to give steroids to help with uh, lung maturity. Um, multiple things uh, can be used, indomethacin, nifedipine, terbutaline. Terbutaline is what our OB doctors use here. Uh, you also will see magnesium given commonly. They uh, use that for fetal neural protection. So as for our patient, uh, she luckily had no instability uh, or delivery on the EMS ride uh, down the street. She did end up going emergently to the OR and had a low transfer C-section about an hour later. They had noted on their um, strips that the baby was having decelerations and what had a baseline tachycardia. Um, the patient was intubated and in the NICU for a few days. So take home for vaginal bleeding and a greater than 20 weeks uh, gestation. Uh, make sure you consider placenta previa and placenta abruption. Remember, abruption usually is, um, has painful, um, it's painful, especially lower um, abdominal. And then for PPROM, for management, don't forget about Rogam, betamethasone, and antibiotics.